Welcome everyone. This is the this is the platform special interest group for Jenkins. Thanks for being here. And here's our agenda for today. Um, Alex, thanks for joining us. So we've got open action items that we'll review first. Then we've got several topics around Adopt Open JDK. Uh, one as possibly considering it as the as a replacement base JDK for the Jenkins image instead of relying on open JDK. The other is we've got a proposal right now in the community to add a J9 based image in addition to the hotspot based image. So we'll talk about that. Alex, that may frame or help us have further discussion on Docker multi, multi arch. So We'll hear some further from you on that if you've got additional to discuss. Then we'll give a status report on the Windows installer and the code signing thing that are bumping that it's bumping into. Hacktoberfest discussion. And I think we will delay the configuration as code change. Oleg is traveling and on vacation this week, so we'll likely delay that until another meeting. Anything else that needs to be added to the agenda, Alex? No, I think that's, uh, that sounds good. All right. Okay. So first, then, let's review the open action items. Uh, I've still got the action item long-standing to open the JEP for the Docker operating system support platform selection rules. Uh, that won't happen probably for a month or more because I've got other things that I need to focus on, like Hectoberfest. Uh, likewise, Oleg's got one for the Windows support policy by the Jenkins project. And then Alex, you've got the topic on Windows installer code signing. Um, and you, you, you wanna give a, a brief status on that, what you've learned as, as you've watched that ticket flow? Sure, so um, basically the update is, is they're going to create um, some type of LLC, uh, Limited Liability Corporation, to be an entity to be able to purchase the code signing certificate. So we're just waiting on that, the legal stuff for that to go through and then they can I believe purchase some code signing certificates for the Jenkins project. Great. Okay. So limited liability corporation in the US will allow them to have a, a legal entity which isn't tied to a single person, right? That's that's good. Excellent. Yeah, yeah that's very good. Okay, and the core release automation project, I know that Olivier continues working on that right now, but I believe the biggest sticking point still is the code signing. So there's been additional pressure putting on that to get that LLC created. Uh, I'm hoping to hear more within the next two or three weeks. Great. Thank you. Okay, so then the next is that Adopt Open JDK is an alternate uh, JDK implementation uh, which includes JDKs built and tested for various interesting platforms. And they're tested with the Java compatibility kit. They're verified and delivered, and they, they work quite well. I've been using them for many months as an alternative to open JDK. And uh, that, that alternative is now looking more interesting uh, because it's a natural place to get platform support. Uh, for example, they already provide an officially or a, a version that they support that runs on IBM's mainframes. And they provide a version that runs on ARM, for instance, so on the Raspberry Pi style processors. Uh, they, they run in enough interesting places. Plus, of course, they support Windows and Linux and Mac OS. So right now what Jim has, has started is a proposal to discuss what it would take to transition the Docker image that we officially deliver from using OpenJDK to using Adopt OpenJDK. And that would mean that it has to support uh, right now, we deliver a Debian image, we deliver a Debian Slim image, we deliver a CentOS image. Um, Alex, if I remember correctly, we do not yet deliver a Windows image in Docker. Is that no, correct? 
Yeah, not for the master. Um, we are providing images for agents. Um, the SSH agent, JNLP agent, and then just the basic agent image. Um, but I did some work to do uh, a master image on Windows, and people weren't really interested. So uh. I don't know if that's the if, if there's any reason to bring one up at all. Um, one thing that none of the organizations have is nano server, Windows nano server images. So um, that's something I was going to work with Jim Crowley to see if we could work with the Adopt Open JDK team to cr uh, create nano server images. And now, could you give me and help me out? What is nano server? That's a Windows product. Give me a little bit of overview on that. Yeah, so if you do a normal like Windows Server Core Docker image, it's like 2.5 gigabytes, which is pretty large. Uh, Nano Server is around 500 megabytes. So it's a significantly smaller image, but provides the basic uh, um, support for things. Uh, mainly it would be used for agents, not for a master. I see. Okay, so this would give me the benefits of running on Windows kernel, running running with Windows file system, Windows kernel, but without the large image size. Okay. It's kind of like a slim. Right, version. right, yeah. It's, all right, so like slim for Windows. Interesting, okay. So, but you say that, but you say not even Adopt Open JDK has a nano server image. That's correct, and there, there's actually a bug since, um, at least in the uh, JDK 8, since version uh, 222, um, that caused problems with nano server images because it doesn't have all of the DLLs and stuff that, um, like the Windows Server Core has. So it's smaller, obviously. Uh huh. So um, there were a couple bugs, but those have been resolved. So we should be able to do nano server images now. Oh, oh, okay. All right. So the bugs that were reported have been resolved for nano server should be possible but doesn't exist yet yeah so um, jim said he had a contact adopt us in jdk um that we could work with to try and get some nano server images created as well all right excellent that's great thank you very much Yeah, that's very encouraging. Now, one of my concerns was with all the master images we have, I am quite dependent, and I assume others have the same bad behavior, if you will, that the master images are very important and their exact content is quite important. So, for instance, I depend on certain pa on packages that are in, in Debian in the image. We can't change that, I suspect, or we'll get lots of grumbling. Um, now, the other one was, and I think Jim's proposal looks okay for that. The other one was Alpine support, if I remember right, is is still problematic uh, for 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 the JDKs because, for instance, Alpine for J, Open JDK 11 isn't isn't supported at all. Have you heard anything on that topic further, Alex? Have not. Um... And I don't know if Jim looked at JDK 11 when he was looking at their unofficial Alpine images. Um, so I'm not sure about that. Okay, so unofficial images available for Open JDK. Or no, for Adopt Open JDK, because I thought I saw that that the job the the JDK project refused to do Alpine because of the the C library on which Alpine is based. I think what he said was that they they actually just installed glibc. Ah, on the or something, okay. but I, I don't remember for sure. Okay. All right. Great, uh, Natasha. Thanks for joining. Um, all right. So anything else on on? Oh, oh. So that I think covers the topics I know about Adopt Open JDK. Alex, unless there's something else that you wanted to be sure we capture in the notes. Oh, maybe we should capture next steps. So next steps, I think, are evaluate the pull requests um, to make the transition. 
How do we, um, I think it's important you mentioned uh, that not knowing or making sure that the packages that people rely on are still there. Uh -huh. um, we want to solicit feedback from the dev group um, to see what packages people rely on so we can make sure that any decisions we make are not going to break people. Yes, yeah, see there I was assuming that we, we rather even than soliciting feedback that what we do is we make our goal that that we don't lose any packages in the transition. Okay. So that's that's a good idea. I, I was thinking, whoops, excuse my bad edit. I was thinking that confirm the package contents only change J, the JDA the JDK, not any of the uh, any other package definitions or package inclusions. And but I think you've got a good point. Uh, ask the dev group dev list uh, if there are specific package requirements which can't be retained right if we find hey the failure to include open jdk means that we lose these thing these packages that were implicitly installed that now don't get installed by adopt open jdk do we need to explicitly install them So I guess what that really needs is needs a, an integration test to we check package do, content. We should also verify that the size of the image isn't um, you know, horribly different. Oh, oh, good point. Right. Confirm uh, image size it is not dramatically larger, right? If we've if we've suddenly bloated it with far more packages, that increases its potential attack surface. Right. Good. Okay. I think that's all for my end. Great. All right. Okay. If we discover great. Okay. Are we discussing the Open J9 as a separate? I think we should do it as a separate, and I'm ready to start that now. Are you ready for that discussion? Sure, I don't know a lot about it. But <laughs> okay, well, so first let's give an overview for those those who may be not, not entirely aware. So Open J9 is a different um, garbage collector, if you will. My garbage collector is the wrong way to say it. It's a different virtual machine implementation, right? So um, it's a competitor to Hotspot. Hotspot, the de facto virtual machine image. And what it has as a benefit is that it, it, it is designed for small environments, um, fast startup environments, and uh, low memory environments. So, for example, that makes it particularly interesting for places where we may have less memory than, than typical. Um, my Raspberry Pis, um, a, a pine board, or those kind of things where a, a constrained environment. The fast startup time is particularly interesting for use when testing and, and or if we're running things like the Jenkins file runner where it starts a Jenkins instance, performs some action, and then stops. Cutting the startup time is, is very in interesting there because it cuts the, the cost. I would think that uh, Jenkins X might be interested in faster startup times as well. Right, right, exactly. Places where, where reducing the cost of startup is a help matter a bunch. So Open J9 is interesting for that. However, um, it, it is because it's a different virtual machine. There can be bumps and bruises on things, places where we were unwittingly dependent on the hotspot virtual machine and need need some code changes. However, Open J9 uh, initial testing looked quite promising. Uh, it has one other feature which allows it to do. Um, 
oh dear, there's a there's a word for it in the compiler world, where what you do is you do preload a cache, preloading ahead of time. Yes, yes, exactly. It's ahead of preload the cache of Java objects before before starting the virtual machine uh, at virtual machine startup. And what that that the idea then would be, we could um, compile and do a start Jenkins in the Docker image build process and stop it, stop Jenkins, and include the resulting files in the image to reduce startup time even further. Um, it's but that's not if I understand correctly not a currently supported technique by the uh, by the build process that we have I think there was a an issue filed um, by another I don't remember the gentleman's name but he was going to look at kind of some of the stuff that he had to do to get it working and then he was going to do a PR for it oh good okay all right yeah, so for me that that one because it's it, it it makes OpenJ9 interesting. I assume it would be more interesting for agents, for example, than for than than as much for the master because sometimes we've got ephemeral agents where it's crucial that we start them and stop them very quickly. By the way, um, Adopt OpenJDK has Docker images that you can use as a base with OpenJ9. Ah, good. Okay. All right. Another factor in switching to adopt open JDK. Ah, right, right. In fact, and that was one of the motivators for Jim Crowley, I think, was hey, how can we if we if we switch over to adopt open JDK, we get the benefit of their their standard images. Very good, thanks. Now that's that's all that I have right now. I haven't done any evaluation of OpenJ9. I haven't seen a pull request yet. I think next steps there are to discuss discuss the issues with um, in the dev mailing list and uh, test and experiment. Now what? One of the thoughts I had was um, agents and the master. There was a report I remember on the mailing list of significant improvements in master startup time, um, but I believe the person who did those tests was using this um, preload cache to make the startup time even better. Any other things that you wanted to note there, Alex? No, that's good for me. Okay. Uh, Natasha, I see that you had joined. Thanks very much for joining us. Natasha's a contributor from our, from the Google Summer of Code. Uh, hey. <laughs> Were there topics that you wanted to be sure that we put onto the agenda, Natasha? Um, so uh, this was like a couple of weeks ago. Oleg asked me, so I had gotten some like feedback on the um, the plugin installation manager, and so Oleg had invited me to like just discuss that uh, on one of these calls. And I know like last time uh, the meeting was <laughs> canceled, or uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what happened. So yeah, so I, if there's time, I wouldn't mind like talking over um, some of the feedback that was given. I, I think let's go ahead now. This is a great time. If you don't mind taking it now, I'll take notes and we'll let you go ahead and and provide a summary where where we're at with the plugin installation manager and and what do you think the next st steps are, et cetera. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess like we can start kind of with like current status. So <laughs> once school started, I haven't really been doing much work on it. Um, I did have like a couple questions this was like unrelated to uh, this particular feedback but I think the next step was like releasing basically the first official version and 
uh, I was always like a little bit nervous to do that because I don't know, it, like if basically once you release that, then you have to support, you know, backwards compatibility. So I don't know, maybe Alex would have some input. Like, do you think that's good to go? Or um, is there anything else that you think should be included or taken out um, before I do that? I, I thought it was at a really good state. Um, I thought you'd done phenomenal work over the summer. Um, so I think it's I think it's ready for a first release and and yeah you do have to think about backward compatibility and stuff but um, you know at a certain point you're not going to be making a ton of changes I would think but just adding features so I think it should be okay um, not too bad to support it and plus remember it's a you're not the sole person that has to support it either so you have a whole team of contributors who can help too so just remember okay. that too. Yeah, the, the repository is, is open, right? It's open in the sense that it's a public repository. So yeah. others can submit pull requests for your, you to evaluate. Or Now, Natasha, the, we did get a transition to the, the GitHub from Wiki for documentation to GitHub. I assume that the plugin installation manager hasn't gone through that transition yet. So if someone wanted to contribute a pull request to you for that change, you'd at least, I assume, be willing to evaluate it. Have I understood correctly? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess let me understand. So I know Oleg had asked about that too. And are you talking about like transitioning from Jira to like GitHub issues or are you no, talking about something else? No, not for issues. So it's a good question. So issues, will you can continue to track wherever the documentation typically is in a readme file or some other place uh, many plugins provide their have from a long history provided their documentation on wiki.jenkinsci.org.io or jenkins.io so that wiki though we've taken it read only because of spam problems and because we found that we prefer to maintain the documentation right inside the inside the plugin notes own repository and I think you're probably actually already putting the documentation there we just have to make a minor change to your palm file and it will start publishing automatically onto the site plugins.jenkins.io it, it won't though because it's not a plugin ah it's, okay it's a tool. so um, I don't know if there is a wiki um, entry right now is there Natasha I don't think so. I think um, at least all the documentation I've written has pretty much been directly on GitHub. Okay, so no issue then. Uh, that's, that's, let me put a note for Mark Waite, investigate how tools are documented, um, where, etc. So then that probably means, if anything, if we want to add further documentation, it might be put it on Jenkins.io or put a, li a link on Jenkins.io to the actual documentation on GitHub. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not sure. Like, where a Jenkins file runner, for instance, keeps its docs mm, on, right. on Jenkins.io. So that would be a good um, maybe a documentation sig. Yeah. Be yeah, a topic about tool documentation. Great. I will put that on the on the doc sig agenda for tomorrow morning. Thanks, Natasha. Back to you. Okay. Um. All right. And then, uh, so just in terms of uh, some of the feedback that had been given, um, so all of that is posted on, uh, our the I posted it on the Gitter chat. Um, but uh, so some of it I think is not as relevant or um i think you know if i guess it does uh in some ways um point out that maybe i should make more things clear on the on the documentation um but uh so i'll, I'll just kind of go over um some of that uh so um doo -doo -doo. i think um so i guess like the first question that I had was um, so in terms of like if you um, like input for the tool if you have a txt file um, it'll kind of accept like the following format like the plugin name 
um, the version and then uh, like a URL if you want to um, download it directly uh, from a URL. And so one of the problems that I had uh, sort of had was like, so uh, those are s separated by colon and, um, but then there's also kind of like a colon and um, like if in your URL too. So um, I think that that more or less, it was like kind of hard for me to figure out like the best way to, um, I guess, parse that. And so um, one of the things that like I had uh, done was just like, and I think this is what I was already um, doing, but um, if like, if you have, uh, say you if you do input a, a url then the version will just be ignored and i think like the expectation would be that people would just leave that uh null or just like have an empty string there um but uh it could you could end up in some situations where people like don't do that or it could be uh sort of confusing because yeah basically if you have a url then the version would just kind of be ignored. And the uh, if, if you're downloading it from a URL, you could actually have it if they, you did include a version where those versions don't match. So I don't know, do you guys have any feedback on that? Because I try to make it like sort of clear. So uh, I think like what I had said is like, basically that you should include a quote unquote placeholder for a version. But like what I meant by that is just have that null. Um, so he like pointed out that, yeah, you could end up with sort of, and this is true anyway, that you could end up with kind of like these like weird scenarios. So, um, yeah. Do you guys have any feedback on that? Are you, are you using a split, a split up that identifier or are you using like regex? Um, I think I'm using a, I, I think I'm using split. There's so, a, the second parameter that you can pass the split to do a limit. Okay. So you can limit to three or something. I don't know if that solves the issue, but it's something maybe you could try. Okay. I I might be doing that. Um, I can't. It's been actually been a while since I've like looked at that. I'd have to double check and see. But I remember that was one of the things when I was first creating it that was like seemed a little tr tricky. Um, but yeah, I can check that. Yeah, so I'm I'm not overly worried about I I think the choice to put colons as the separator between the of the things that follow plugin name is the right choice because you keep compatibility and for me that was the crucial thing so I wouldn't I would lobby against switching separators uh, I'm not as concerned about the hey if you if you specify the version and the URL you get exactly what's at the URL that's for me that's desired behavior. I would not want you to silently apply some rules to the, or apply rules to that optional URL to attempt to use the version number. URL is, is not used in the other, the other formats that typically use plugins.txt file, right? They only say plugin name and version, as far as I recall. Is, no, you can, do, you can do URL. Oh, you plugin. can. Yeah. I, would, I would say just kind of give it an order of precedence. So the URL is the highest precedence, and then the version is secondary precedence. Maybe that's what you put in the docs. And okay. Say, if someone specifies a URL, you're getting that URL regardless of what version it is or what version you specify. But if okay. you don't specify a URL and you specify a version, you get that version. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I think basically kind of my take my one takeaway was like maybe I just need to make the docs a little clearer. Um, because it seemed like some of the wording I had was like a little bit confusing. Doctor um, is hard. It's but, doctor, <laughs> doctor is the hardest thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things you don't realize it's confusing to other people in the, until they start looking at it because you've been looking at it for so long or you just kind of expect that people should know. <laughs> but it's a, not always a good assumption. Um. Okay, so let me see what uh, some of the other feedback is. Okay, um, so this is, uh, he said, or he recommended um, versioning the plugin 
input txt file, which um, he said this will allow you to make updates to the parameters while easily maintaining backwards compatibility. Uh, many public APIs do this. For example, Docker composes um, YAML files. Do you guys think that that would also be like a good idea? So I don't object, but that means you've now introduced a syntax that none of the other tools understand because, so versioning the plugins text file, I think means add one or more lines, right? That declare what the version number is of this text file, right? Yeah, that, that's my understanding. But does, does he want you to store off the version that was previously used and then compare it? Or what was, I, I don't remember the feedback on this particular item. Um, I think. Alex, I think it was that it's added, it's added inside the file, right? So there's no need to store it because it's in plugins.txt itself. That's a, it's a syntax. So there is a comment format, isn't there, Alex, that the hash mark is used as a comment? Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just wondering what he wants done with the version. Um, yeah, I think it, it was just uh, if uh, like, okay, my understanding is like if it, if I change something about like the format, so in the future, like that would just help with kind of knowing which, which format you're currently on um, or if you're trying to use like an older format so I guess like in some ways, if we always say like, it has to be backwards compatible going forward, but maybe there's this, if you want to continue to add things, maybe it'd be helpful for you to know. I'm, I don't know. Um, yes. So yeah, so you guys don't think that that's necessary or you, it just doesn't, it's different from the way a lot of other um, you said just kind of like the way it's done now and in other places. No objections from me uh, to adding it, but I would just add it as a parsed comment, right? The, the format, the file format already accepts comments. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you said, hey, we're going to, by de facto standard, make the parse, if, if the first line starts with a hash mark, a space, the word version colon, and then some string, that will be treated as the version of the of the file format then you haven't broken compatibility and if in the future someday you said i need to make a major format change uh, people could say all right the version number is now version two instead of one and and you could then honor that in parsing the file uh, so long as so long as you don't object to using it as a as a, a de facto standard by by declaring it as to be a, a comment in the current format. The other thing that could be done is if you do need to change formats in the future, you can add a command line parameter. Um, you know, version two parser or whatever, you know, dash dash version two or something like that. So I, okay. I think I think would be would be fine. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I'm hesitant to have you add it as a non-comment just because then other tools that read plugins.txt won't know what to do with it. Gotcha. What other tools do, does that include? So the the install plugins.sh, or is that the right script name, Alex? Inside the Docker file image, there is a script that parses plugins.txt and uses it to load the defined plugins into a Docker image. I think yeah. it's... Yeah, this the plugin tool is going to replace that. Agreed. Uh, I agreed. Mean, not, not for a period of time necessarily, but we definitely want to get as soon as a, a you know a 1.0 release is done, we want to start PRs and stuff, and do testing and so forth. So, I, I yeah. Okay. Um, are there other places where? Because I I think yeah, in terms of the plugin. Um, the plugin install plugins bash script the yeah the goal would just be that this would take the place of that so i'm i'm not i'm not aware of others but given the breadth and the depth of people's use of jenkins i'm confident there are other places where that format has been used okay 
Um, okay, and then the next piece of feedback. So I I haven't ever used Terraform, so I don't know. I guess I didn't really understand this quite, or I didn't have enough context for this. Um, he said, uh, and I don't know if this would be a plan with this tool anyways, um, but he said, should you expand your tool to interact directly with Jenkins? A great feature to add would be Terraform support. That way you could represent all the desired plugins in HCL lossy declarative language for infrastructure code, which would easily, which would lead to easily automated use of your tool. So I don't know if you guys understand that feedback. So I'm, I'm accustomed to Terraform being used to define a declare to give a declarative declaration a declarative definition of cloud infrastructure and that lets for instance we use it to define a whole bunch of machines that we'll use for training and then automatically tear them down when we're done um, and and so terraform in that case just lets us declare i want this many machines of this type with this installed on them etc um, i i think that's way beyond the your current scope Okay. Okay, yeah, that was just, um, yeah, some of the feedback he gave. Um, and then uh, the last sort of thing that he had said was, so we had um, gone sort of back and forth about um, some of the default behaviors. So um, in terms of like which plugins you and the dependencies that you install so um ultimately what i ended up doing was making it um by default to install the dependencies that are uh listed within um like the metadata in the update center um but the problem with that is that sometimes those are a little bit conservative or uh maybe a little bit i don't know there's much like newer forms but um with the previous tool, with the like always getting the latest um, dependencies, the problem with that was that um, those aren't always deterministic, so it changes as later plugins come out. So, um, so the last piece of feedback that you said, and I think that this is, um, I guess, like a good idea that uh, I haven't done yet, but uh, he said that he was a fan of the deterministic route by default. Um, with the optional ability to um, quote unquote update auto update all um, so uh, yeah so I think basically he's uh, he said that uh, he's a fan of having software that does the same thing you know today and six months from now but uh, it's good to also get the latest version um, because that's most likely like the most secure um and yeah then he could perform like updating like i guess on his own time um so i think that was most of the stuff i don't know if you have any other i guess there's a few other things um so, yeah so i guess yeah for for my clarity natasha so uh -huh. the plugin installation manager today has chosen the deterministic path that's cool. Yes. Okay, so you, yeah. you read inside the metadata from plugin A to decide which of its which version of its dependence you should be installed. And I assume if I declare explicitly one of those dependencies and its version, you use my explicitly declared one, not the implicit one from the updates. Right. The right. And then, but there was like a lot of you know feedback on that too, where um, people. We also wanted to have compatibility with what's done now. Um, so yeah, there's also the option where you can always just take the latest if you want, but by def that's not the default. So by default, it'll be, it should be um, deterministic and you should get, uh, yeah, whatever those versions are. And then if you do want like a, a higher version or the latest of specific uh, dependencies, you could specify that. Um, and then, yeah, if you, if you do want just take, to take the latest of all, um, then you can specify that too. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you for that summary. Thanks very much.
Um, okay, so yeah, I guess that's uh, most of that. So I don't know if you guys have any other uh, feedback or anything. I mean, if you, I could probably do like a release today if <laughs> now that I feel a little bit more confident that uh, it sounds like it's ready, I, I think. And um, yeah, I just hadn't really, once school started, <laughs> I had a lot more distractions. So I haven't been able to dedicate as much time. I actually, you've done wonderful things. Thank you very much for your contributions in the community, Natasha. I think, I think it's time to do 1.0. 1.0 is not the last release, right? We're going right. to, we intend to continue releasing. So calling it 1.0 has had plenty of time to, to, to bake, plenty of time to settle. Certainly there will be more things discovered and it feels perfectly reasonable to call it 1.0. Okay. Great, congratulations. Anything else, Natasha? Uh, no, I think that's it from my end. Super, all right. Thank you very much. So Alex, the next topic we had on the agenda was Docker MultiArch. Anything you want to report there, particularly given the Adopt Open JDK discussions? Um, not at this point. Um, I still need to review kind of what Adopt Open JDK um, how that would work for the multi arc stuff. We have a lot of scripts in place right now, and um, I just need to review all that. I haven't had a chance to. Great. Okay. And anything else on the Windows installer status? We've talked about Jenkins core automation and the code signing certificate being the, the crucial thing there. Anything else that needs to be highlighted? Um, I do have a um, pull request in place on the packaging repository. I, I kind of moved my changes into there, and Olivier is using that as part of his release automation. Um, so he's building the installer um, and, and so forth on his release infrastructure. And so, yeah, we're just waiting on the code setting certificate. Great. Excellent. Okay. Super. Thank you. Uh, last topic I had was uh, Hacktoberfest and the platform topics. I am thrilled to note that we have over 50 first time contributors that have come on to the project in its plugins or other core or other tools since the start of October. Over 100 pull requests. We've got only a week left. Here's your chance. Keep promoting it. Keep encouraging people to look at the newbie friendly bugs. Uh, it's, it's an impressive set. There are still over 200 uh, newbie friendly issues that people can look at. Uh, this little dashboard presents them like this. So you can choose the component that you want to use that you'd like to help. Uh, you can choose the severity across the top. And then when you do that, it will show you the bugs in that type. So let's look, for instance, at my favorite, the platform labeler and its three open newbie friendly bugs. And here they are. They are actually three feature requests automatically label Linux Mint, automatically label Fedora Linux, and automatically label Clear Linux. So if somebody wanted to contribute, they could do, use those. Only a week left on Hacktoberfest. Any questions with regard to Hacktoberfest? None for me. Great, thanks. And we will defer the, the configuration as code topic until Oleg returns. Hope to see everybody in two weeks. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks.